Good evening, we're gonna get started. So if you wanna grab a slice of pizza and take a seat. So tonight you're gonna hear from Jason Forrest. Uh, Jason Forrest is a UX designer and data visualization specialist at McKinsey and Company here in New York City. He's also the editor-in-chief of Nightingale, the Journal of the Data Visualization Society, and serves as the group's publication director. Uh, he regularly writes on the subject of historic data visualization, and his best known work is a series of exploratory articles on the data visualizations of W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, please welcome Jason. Yay. Hey. Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I just want this to be like pretty casual, informal. If I'm talking about something and get a question, just, just say, hey, what's, what's that? You can put your hand up if you want to be nice. But it's just, you know, totally chill. Like, we're just here to have a conversation and to talk to each other. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for, for letting me come and talk about a subject that I'm hopelessly addicted to. Um, something that my wife, who's a contemporary visual artist, is just like, where did this come from? Um, something that I myself am just shocked that I'm wake up in the, morning, in the middle of the night talking like, oh, what about this book? There's a, there's a footnote in this appendix, and I wonder what's there. I bet you that if we look it up, we can find one of the people, that, a contemporary of Otto Neurath, and then that whole, starts a whole thing. And so anyways, I'm just glad to come and talk to you tonight. So that said, uh, this is the first thing. Twitter, follow me, yay. So this uh, discussion tonight will have kind of two parts. The first is kind of, um, we'll look at 10 individual charts from the past that are, I don't know, unusual, different, not so used today. And then at the end, we'll talk about two projects kind of more in depth. Um, and the last one, I get to share, like, finally something that I've been able to do. McKinsey, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but reading the news, it's kind of a secret, secret organization. We don't like to talk too much about what we do. So I had to like really beg and plead. So I'm really excited. It's the first time I really get to talk about you, you, research that I've been working on for about two years and also a really big project. So yay. Uh, OK. So this is the second one. Oh, uh, the other thing is that, um, as Kim said, I am a part of the Data Visualization Society. It's a free group organization. You can sign up. Um, my particular role is I'm the editor-in-chief of our Medium publication, and really our publication in general called Nightingale. Um, we are an organization that runs about 25, uh, well, 20 to 25 articles a month. We have like, a number of editors and managing editors and all kinds of fun stuff. And our goal is just to really help new people write about interesting stuff and to have a voice and to be heard and to engage in a dialogue. And it's really nothing hidden than that. Like, we have an organization and we just really want you to get involved. So if anybody's interested in writing for Nightingale or the Data Visualization Society, come talk afterwards or just send me an email. My email's at the end. And we'll, you know, hang out. Any questions yet? No. OK. All right. So I'm going to start with the three takeaways first, and I'll put them again at the end. Uh, but I think that we as practitioners find ourselves in a moment where almost any kind of data-related program can create a chart. We have charts flying around in almost any technology, any application, and they're largely dictating their designs to us at this point. We have you know, capabilities like D3 that allow a tremendous amount of flexibility, but we very rarely use them. So there's all kinds of ways that people in the past have explored data visualization information design. And so today, we're just going to take a look at some of these. So the three, the three takeaways. The most important rule, there are no rules, right? We have all these best practices that we're obsessed with. They suck. There's no rules. Your rule as a designer is to talk to somebody so that they understand what you want trying to tell them. That's it. That's it. If that means it's street art, if that means that it's a nice table, doesn't matter. That's your job. Communicate. Cool. Uh, second rule, use whatever you can. <laughs> Just like I said, any tool, any process, any design, use whatever you can. And the last is a great way to learn about this is by taking a look at the past. Okay, 
so jumping in our first chart, this is from, let's see, uh, Walter E. Weld from a great book called How to Chart from 1939. So I love this chart. It's so easy to see. It's so easy to read. You totally get it in an instant. So this is from a report on workplace accidents, and it shows the results of fatigue for an industrial plant. And it's basically a nightingale rose placed on top of a clock. And you can see how the scale of accidents grows as it gets towards lunchtime and towards the end of the afternoon. It's great, isn't it? It's so easy. It's so easy. I love it. I love it. Uh, it's just so easy to read. And what I really like about this is that the design of this just matches how we think about time. Like we have a concept of what a clock is, and you see it right here, and especially in 1959. Okay, so this is from uh, one of my favorites, Mary Eleanor Speer, from her book, Practical Char Charting Techniques in 1969. Uh, uh, Speer was uh, a very uh, widely acknowledged expert in data visualization, but because she was a woman and maybe because she just wasn't as big as some of the other names, we really kind of overlooked her place in history. We've run a really great article on her uh, in Nightingale, and we'll do another one. But her book is not that hard to find. It's like five, ten bucks. You can find a book all about historical charting techniques. It's amazing, and her voice comes through in a way that a lot of the contemporaries don't. So by all means, take a look at that one. OK, so we got two really fun charts here. Uh, the one on the left shows, uh, so this is from a chapter on combining data types. So what she says is kind of like really historical trend. These are just these, these, these bar charts. And then it goes into this giant area chart in the middle with this huge illustration. You basically don't even need the title at all. Like, <laughs> you know what's going on there. Uh, on the right, uh, we see uh, the change in population uh, for a county in Maryland over 30 years. The pie charts on the bottom uh, show how the population changes over time. Oh, sorry, over here. Uh, so what she's done is she's anchored these pie charts to the bottom. And what it does is actually gives you some different way of understanding some context for these line charts as it goes through. And the other thing that I really love about this is that she just made the annotations. It's not like a legend, per se. You know? And uh, of course, the other thing to keep in mind is that these were all hand drawn. You know? So she didn't need anybody like, worrying about how you're going to align these pie charts in the bottom. <laughs> you know? It's like getting shiny to make it work right or something like this. Like, she doesn't care about margins. She had a ruler. So. All right. Uh, the next one, uh, my friend RJ Andrews uh, suggested this book to me. It's Carl G. Karsten's Charts and Graphs right here from 1923. I booked this book for, bought this book for $35. It's worth a lot. Feel free to take a look. Um, I love this one. It's such a good idea. And it's one of those things that's just like, like, why don't we do this anymore? Um, it's uh, effectively kind of an organization chart, a dendrogram kind of mapped to a stack of a bar. You can easily kind of see where things are in proportion to each other and how they aggregate up. It's, it's great. I love it. This one, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah, this is about US casualties in World War I. And another version of this, which I think is also just as interesting, uh, this one is uh, the map of the foreign-born white population of 1920. It's 17 million people across regions, subcontinent, uh, country, and then displays the tally in the horizontal bar charts. So you can see all of these things kind of coming up to this 17 million number, and then, of course, where they lay out here. What I like also so much about this one uh, is how arty these uh, kind of vertical lines are and how it kind of frames the whole thing just by tapering them off. I think it's just great. I love it. Uh, so easy to understand. Uh, I showed this to some of my colleagues and they were like, oh, oh yeah, I get that. You know, it's like if, if you made it today, it wouldn't be something that you'd never, I don't know, if you had some kind of uh, uh, stakeholder would be like, people aren't going to understand it. Of course they will. Of course they will. Just got to tell them. Okay, so this one is a pretty weird one, also from Carson G. Carson. Carl G. Carson, I always do that. Uh, so an organizational chart, uh, an organizational chart of sales. And what you see here is really interesting stuff. So this is the comptroller. We have kind of different organizations. And this is their sales force. 
right? And what this is saying is that basically manufacturing comes down and then it spreads through the whole sales force and then ends back in accounting again. And I like how it's, it, it's, it's weird looking. It makes sense. It takes a minute, but it makes you want to look at it. And I really like that. I really think that's interesting. Um, there's just a tremendous amount of information here. Oh yeah, the other thing I thought was funny is that the, all the funds over here, they flow from purchasing, which I thought was kind of like, it's nice to see these kind of antiquated concepts. Okay, so I got a chance to go on vacation this summer. I went to France in a tiny little village and literally at the top of a mountain, I found this wonderful atlas, four euros. Um, and again, a wonderful concept. This one is just showing the distribution of uh, imports versus exports. It's, anyone? A scale, yes. So you can see the size of the thing, the big ball kind of pushes it on and up. And in the middle, we get this kind of uh, average to show us, are we doing more imports, more exports? And it's so easy to see. You see it, you totally get the concept of what balance is. And again, it maps to our understanding of how things weigh. Oh, Venezuela, what's going on over there? Yeah. Any questions so far? Well, I guess, um, I just wondered um, uh, if people are, are people using a concept of what a scale looks like and what a, what a clock looks like and therefore, and maybe what a map looks like and so maybe they're less able to engage in things like this than they were? Great question. I mean, if you made this for your audience, you would test it, <laughs> right? You would show it to them and you'd talk about it. Does this make sense to you? Does this map to your understanding of what weight is, of what balance is? Honestly, I think they would. I don't, I don't know. I mean, we're a fairly, uh, I would argue, digital savvy group. Does it make sense? I mean, I think so. I think it does on another level just for the semiotics of two heavy things, two things. One's a big thing, one's a small thing that kind of connects to weight. We think about planets. I think I just, I've been surprised sometimes talking to co-equals about reading maps that I take for granted and then they can't read them. That's all. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I, t I totally get it. Listen, I had like a two hour long conversation with my uh, stakeholders about why they couldn't understand a certain chart type. It's not like it happens just to you. It happens to literally everybody in the room, <laughs> right? But the thing that's interesting here, and I'm just gonna go ahead and segue into the next one by my, my, one of my favorites, the wonderful Nigel Holmes, the bane of Tufty's existence. He hated him, he hated him so much. He named a whole thing about it. He named it the data to ink ratio and called it chart junk. But Nigel, he was an information designer for Time Magazine. He wasn't talking to businessmen. He certainly wasn't talking to NASA scientists. He was making complex statistical data interesting for whoever just happened to open up a magazine. I mean, I wouldn't want to call it lowest common denominator, but it was most definitely marketing. Right? So, love Nigel. He is the greatest. This book, $5. $5. It has a wonderful cover. I didn't bring it. Someone stole it from me. No, I gave it. Let him borrow it. But it's a great book. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. Nigel Holmes. Just take a look. If you don't know him and you're, like, intimidated by the idea that there's an illustration, he's a chart, just, just, just put that up to bed. Nigel Holmes. Okay. So, um... Yeah, so the other thing about Holmes is that he was a very astute illustrator. He practiced for a, a great period of time, and he was very conscious of what he was doing. Like, he really knew the rules, and he knew why he was breaking them, and how he could basically play both sides of the fence. And I point to this broken baseline right here as proof. So this is obviously a small infographic that would have been on the corner of a page in Time Magazine, imports versus exports, uh, kind of uh, racial stereotype aside, although arguably uh, it's about a samurai and dealing with the history of Japanese cinema. We also see this broken baseline, we see axes, and we see that the story is the literal giant red line. You know, that's the whole goal. And he writes exhaustively about his whole goal 
is to have someone say, oh, exports really kill it in Japan. <laughs> That's it. That's the whole takeaway. Oh, exports. Wow, Japanese. Wow, the Japanese economy is going great. The one on the right, on the, uh, yeah, on the right. Uh, how can you not love that? Uh, <laughs> it's just a simple old line chart. Nothing to see here. Uh, it shows the price of diamonds spiked and then decreased rapidly. Again, the giant red line is just showing it this. What I love about this is that the graph paper is her stockings, <laughs> right? So fun, so fun. Obviously, diamonds were a girl's best friend. It's basically some kind of gross concept of uh, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, and it's great, again, just connecting to concepts that people have about diamonds. Diamonds were really high, and then they crashed. All right. So I had the good fortune of, tra I've been traveling like a crazy amount, as you'll talk about at the very end. Um, and how am I doing for time? Am I doing good, good for time? Good for time so far? All right, I got a thumbs up. Any questions so far? Anybody want to just rap about something? Anybody over here? No, nothing? All right, I'll keep going. Um, got to go to, uh, to uh, England and found this book. It's a super uh, um, unknown book by Arthur Lockwood called Diagrams from 69. Um, this particular one is pretty interesting. I would say that it's kind of almost an isotype, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but it arranges all the icons around this kind of central axis, showing uh, exports on one side and imports to the right. Uh, and it's showing basically 100%. So everything is 100% kind of moving across this axis of this balance again. And what I like so much about it is, is this was actually for uh, the British market. It was actually in a uh, British encyclopedia. And what I love so much about it is it starts with milk, which is 100% home produced, and ends with tea, right? And again, it matches so much. The one thing that defines British culture so much, tea, is both 50-50 import and export, and everything kind of in between has some relationship to it. Love it. Hey. Um, so another one from Diagrams. I love this one as well. I'd never seen it before. I mean, it kind of is like easy when you kind of get it, but oh my God, I love it so much. So this is uh, from a newspaper that shows you just the uh, maximum minimum air airport times for different cities in Europe, 12 uh, cities in Europe. And it's effectively a stacked bar chart around a central radius. Uh, the airplane icons and layout make it interesting. I love how they point towards the center. Uh, the city center is itself correlates to our concept of a map. Cities have an old part in the center, especially Europe. Uh, and I love how they automatically uh, map to this orientation about what's being conveyed. You know, like, uh, like for example, in Milan, uh, this airport is so far away. I mean, it's 70 minutes away from the downtown. And uh, as opposed to, you know, Berlin, Tempelhof's literally in the middle of the city. So, it, you know, these are just these things, these little tricks that people can do visually to organize this stuff, and I just love it. Ooh, what's that? All right. So, uh, <laughs> this is from Graphis Diagram uh, 2. Uh, from 1994, uh, Graphis was a European kind of design and illustration uh, journal. Um, they did these two or three really great books uh, starting in the 70s and kind of ending with this one. And uh, available, I think, $2 on Amazon or eBay. They just, they're just almost thrown away. Uh, take a look, Graphis diagram, they're just great. They're full of all these incredible exploded diagrams and cutaways. Um, so this one, of course, would be from one of the things that a lot of design companies did uh, in the 1780s. They basically designed uh, 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 corporate annuals. And, uh, and the, so this is a chart that shows the hockey stick growth. 1992, they were negative 2 million. 1993, they were about 1.5. And oh my god, in 1994, they were 8 million or foot. And, you know, the job of this is just, you know, to get people to say, well, what is this? What am I looking at? You know? It, oh, actually, we made $8 million. Hey, that's pretty cool. So I love it. I love it. And again, the use case is stop someone from being bored in a shitty meeting and look at the page. I love it. 
All right, so that's the 10. That's the, uh, that's the 10 charts. Any, any, any sum, uh, sum, summaries, questions? Anything you want to talk about? Sure. I'm just curious, like, I mean, you're saying you're getting these, like, weird bookstores. Like, what? So the question was, where do I get them? Um, you know what? You know what? I, I've given up going to like the design section, and I go up and I say, "Hey, do you have any books about information design?" And they're like, they're either just like, I, I, I don't know what that is. But I was just in Japan actually, and this guy was like, "Yes, I do, and I love that, right? Because <laughs> all you have to do is ask sometimes. So it's not that hard." Um, at the Strand, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the design section upstairs. Um, they have some great books there. But you know, the reality is that all the cool, weird, old ones, like uh, that one over there, like uh, Karsten's uh, Charts and Graphs, Amazon, eBay, stuff like that. So, anything else? Yeah. One thing I was just thinking about. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, one thing I was just thinking about was just not only like how graspable the data was, but also how memorable it was. And something like the Nigel Holmes, uh, like they're really memorable because they have like this picture. With it. The last one, I'm not so sure, but <laughs> but yeah, memorability as like part of it. Yeah, exactly. Sure. I guess kind of tied into that idea of mem memorability. Uh, being impactful. Uh -huh. uh, chart one, I thought actually was like a little bit misleading. Ooh, in interesting. The way that uh, some oh, maybe a desire to make it memorable made it a little bit less precise. It seems like the measurement is actually a two-dimensional measurement from Ooh. the center, but then the it's also represented as area. So there's almost like two different ways that information is being presented. I mean, the image is very impactful and it's very memorable, but somehow the need to shove the information into this memorable graphic has presented information that to my point of view is like a little bit um, confusing. Like for example, the 3% and the 6% mm -hmm. are only scaled in two dimensional, are only accurate in a two dimensional measurement, but in a three dimensional area measurement, the 3% is substantially less than half of the 6%. Ooh, Naomi for the rebuttal. I've seen roses where the data was encoded in the diameter and ones where it's encoded in the area. Florence Nightingale, who was an early user of these, some say she originated them, others mm -hmm. say there's a statistician she worked with, whatever, but she first did them with diameter and then realized we visualize area and she changed all hers to have the data encoded in the area. People have done them recently doing the diameter and as you say, we visualize area, that's just wrong. But what I object to in these charts is that people don't Ooh. know how the data is encoded. So elaborate on that one for us, please. What I just said, sometimes the data is encoded by the, the radius here, uh -huh. sometimes it's encoded by the area. And when you see it, you don't know which one it is. So, so I would for example, looking at the three and the six, as you uh -huh. say, um, it looks as if it's the diameter, but we visualize the area. The same, my same objection goes to bubble charts. Half the time you see them with the data encoded in the diameter and half the time in the area. Sure. So my rebuttal to that one is that no one cares. Um, the only thing that people are seeing is a relationship that something's really small on one side and something really big in another. So the minutia of the 3 to 6 percent is nothing in comparison to the 14 percent. And that 14 percent correlates with lunch and the end of work. To me, that's what matters. And I'm happy to talk at length about whether we should present our percentages in two decibel points or not. But the reality is that if you're presenting a story like this, it's pretty straightforward. Sure. Yeah, so I... Hang on. Uh, one second. Naomi, I wasn't trying to say that like, and to be rude to you at all. <laughs> I'm just trying to say that the point is not in getting into this lost in the details. So. Yeah, so I totally agree with the last point that you just made because me coming from a user experience designer, what I want to know is what is this giving out information? I don't care if it's area or diameter. It's literally written there like 14%, 13%, 10%. And that's all I want to know. Mm -hmm. So that's how I look at it. Uh, so I think it's pretty clear to understand it's 
14%, 13%. So it's easy to relate and compare. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a wonderful segue. Oh, actually, do you want to, you have one last thing to say there. I agree with, oops, I agree with both of the two last statements. Um, and I would say that it really depends on what the goal is of the visualization. Uh -huh. Like if you're trying to calculate investments, probably you need a very exact values. But if you're trying to show that like, oh, around lunchtime, people are more careless, um, that does the trick. Um, I did have a problem with the last visualization though. Two, two y axes, axes and this you know, one? x axis. Oh my god, how could you have a problem with this one? It's so scientific. The question I wanted to ask, um, and I don't want to uh, oversimplify sure. this, but it seems like metaphor is a really big part of uh, what, how it, the information is communicated. Um, what are some other things uh, like metaphor that you might think of and be like, oh, that's an, an ingredient that a beta biz needs to be successful? Well, I guess what we've been talking about is semiotics ultimately, uh, Gestalt principles and all these kind of basics of what the core elements are of design. So, you know, whether an area is more important or a color or size, like these are kind of the core elements of how we read anything. It, same thing's true for artwork that it is, or graphic design that it is for data visualization. We read things visually and cert using certain principles. So, I mean, I think that's really important. And I think the other one is the context for how we present things, right? And so that's why, you know, this is not <laughs> that other, ch that, this is not data science. This is marketing, right? And knowing what the role of these things, Nigel uh, uh, Holmes' work is marketing, you know, it's, you know, Con conceptual marketing to a degree or statistical marketing, but it's just about imp implanting an idea. So, is that a decent answer? I don't know. What is it? I don't know. There's probably some more out there. Okay, so let's move forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you guys for having a conversation. I like the fact that it's like, like a little difference of opinion, which is nice. It's nice. Okay, uh, let's see. So, Okay, first up, I have two projects to present. The first, I want to talk about Otto and Marie Neurath, the isotype, uh, previous, also called the Vienna Method of Pictorial Statistics. Any, who, who here knows about isotypes? One, two, three, five, wow, okay. So, uh, an isotype is an inter, uh, international pictorial language created by Otto Neurath in 1924. Uh, he did it in collaboration with, with Marie Rademeister, who later became his wife in 1941. Uh, while Otto invented the isotype, and there's absolutely no question about this, uh, Marie was really its central contributor. She acted as the transformer, what a job title, uh, for 71 years, or for, I'm sorry, for 41 years. Um, her role, we would call her role of transformer somewhere between data scientist and designer at this point. It's a role that she made up and she iterated on until it became a part of the team. Uh, initially called the Vienna Method of Pictorial Statistics, they changed it to the isotype when they had to leave Vienna via the beginning of the outbreaks of World War II to make it more international. And it's an acronym of International System of Typographic typographic picture education. Yeah. Um, so what we're seeing right here is an example of the same data in three ways, a table, uh, a, a chart, and an isotype. So Otto Neurath was a founding member of the Vienna Circle. He was a philosopher and an urban planner who became more interested in teaching facts to ordinary people. As he initially experimented with methods of displaying information, he started to display statistical facts using pictograms influenced by his childhood learning about hieroglyphics and other types of visual communication. The pictorial statistics were so popular with common people in his initial displays on urban housing, it led to an exhibition called the Gesellschaft and Wirtschaft Museum, or the Museum for Social and Economic Affairs, that here is presented at the Vienna City Hall, which we see uh, in 1933. In 1936, Otto and Marie wrote a book called International Picture Language, The First Rules of Isotype, 
It's written in basic English, another kind of cool uh, concept where they're going to teach English by reducing it to the fewest syllable words. Uh, sorry, anecdote. Um, the book introduces the, uh, the isotype as a picture language to extend the reach of the Neurats and explain their findings. It does not teach their methodology, which is pretty interesting as we go on to see. Uh, Otto explains how the isotypes should function both by themselves as individual charts, but also, also with the context of the other charts, sculptures and photographs. In effect, they created a system of communication. I love this one. I'm sorry, it's a little low res. So Otto and Marie were joined by Gerd Ernst in 1924. Oh, 1926, excuse me. Uh, he was a Dutch modernist painter, uh, and his work was already uh, creating reductivist, almost minimalist, icon-like paintings. And they started to collaborate with him for two reasons. One, because they needed someone, an artist, to help really refine each one of these icons and to make them both, both, uh, both really attractive and uh, really communicative. The trio worked together exhaustively between 1926 and 1940, and they traveled from, they had exhibitions in uh, Berlin, Vienna, Moscow, and the Netherlands during that time. As the team explored different kinds of data, they consistently evolved their methods and experimented with different forms. Sometimes they returned to the same idea over and over to refine it. This is the same concept created by the Neurath 13 years apart, both focused on the location of the world's mer merchant marines. Otto was very critical of this one over here, despite the fact that it was quite well known, because he thought that it was both uh, dishonest and disrespectful to drag the flags out, mm -hmm. which I thought was really nice, especially when you get to these little ones over here. He writes really at length, like, it's really disrespectful to do this to people's flags. Okay, what was the name of the um, Dutch artist who's collaborating? Gerd Arnst. G-E-R-D-A-R-N-T-Z? Uh, uh, A-R-N-T-Z. You're welcome. So this chart was made shortly before Otto's death in 1945. It shows a cross-section of the geographic elevation of the US plus the location of different crop types. The team was extremely savvy on how it created each image and often used a method very similar to design thinking about 25 years before it was ever considered in design circles. Um, an anecdote about this fascinating collaborative organization that they set up for themselves, so much so that they wrote at length that no one person has the rights to this work. It's fascinating. And the reason why it's important is because recently, Gerd Arndt's relatives are now claiming the copyright. They're trying to reinforce the copyright. But he literally wrote as a team with their signatures on that, no one person can own an isotype. It is information, which I think is very interesting. As the Neurats fled Vienna in advance of the World War II, they, they continued to explore different types of ideas, specifically also in exhibition design. This included wooden isotype sculptures for the audience to touch and play with, which deal with, with had dials and pulleys. You can see uh, up here, the top figure to the right. The Neurath eventually fled mainland Europe to England where they formed the Isotype Institute. They focused primarily on books and created wonderfully complex diagrams on geopolitics, such as this diagram showing how the Russian government coordinated the cotton industry. Want me to walk you through it? So what you have here, it's, I, it's fascinating. I have an article about this that I'm more than happy to send out to the group, or you can just take a look on Medium. Um, but basically, this is talking about the Central Planning Committee. What you have is a series of open questions that descend down each level of the Russian government from the highest government on a, on a federal level all the way down to an individual territory. That, those questions become answered and they go back up slowly. More answers are added as it goes up the chain until directions are then given down the chain again. So the collective farm 
Uh, so, and then at the same time, each one of these levels is also communicating across. And think about it, it makes sense. Each region will talk to each other region. Each small collective would talk, to, talk across to each other. So you have this line of communication that runs horizontally where questions and answers are vertical. Love it. And at the end, ultimately, you get this thing where collective farms have directions. They <laughs> make cotton. They ship it to the factory. And the factory ships it to the shop. So you have a whole idea of economy in one image, which I love. The other thing I love so much about the, the Neurath is not only they made all of these isotypes, these icons, but they also made their own icon, their own isotype, and they fought for their ownership over and over and over again. They're even credited on books saying so-and-so author and the Isotype Institute. And I love how authorship itself is also reduced to an isotype. Yeah, I don't have any pictures of that, but I'm happy to talk about them. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe you can just describe them a little bit better. Or more. They're made out of wood. Um, there's a few that I know of. Um, there was a few there. Are, it's funny because I think that a lot of the similar practices you'd see in like uh, educational museums today, where you have something where you have like a, something you're flipping up and seeing some kind of difference, maybe two different time periods. But they also had these ones where you're able to kind of move these kind of bands and dials around where you have these pulleys and big dials. And the other thing they had is they had uh, a bunch of maps that had isotypes with little magnets. And one of the things that's really cool is that they had all these school groups. And, and at first they were like, well, these kids are stealing the magnets. And Otto, because he was just an awesome dude, was like, yeah, it's okay, we'll make more. So they were trying to actually, they thought that they were actually going to like make more security to keep those darn kids away. But instead, they were just like, yeah, it's okay, the kids like it, they remember something. It's a great story, I love it. So Otto dies in 1945, like I said, and Marie continues for an, an additional 26 years by herself. She continues with educational materials, creating posters for the, for the Nigerian government, as well as a massive series of science books for children. These books were recently the uh, subject of an exhibition at the House of Illustration in London, and it's actually having quite a resurgence now. Marie, in the act of doing this, she became a subject matter expert in a few different aspects. On the left, we see a diagram of how a housefly walks on the ceiling. And this one up here about how crabs burrow in the sand. And they say that this is actually something that like, almost no scientist knows about, which I kind of felt a little dodgy about. But the point is, is that she regularly, and we, the, uh, the isotope archives in Reading, England, has the correspondence with Marie and some of the world's uh, foremost uh, authorities, scientific authorities on different subjects. I find the whole story of the isotype and the, and the Neurath just totally fascinating. Otto Neurath had a unique vision and a high-minded concept for ethically teaching the world about facts. Holistically speaking, their world was filled with systems for creating efficiencies and visual accuracies as they used this to make the world beautiful and deeply interesting that begged the audience to engage with them. Just love those guys. Any questions before I move on? OK. Uh, so the last section of the talk tonight, and it's the last project. This is the first time I've really talked about this. So I've been doing this research on Arthur H. Scaife for about two years now. Um, you're really some of the first people I've ever seen some of this stuff, which I'm really excited about. So uh, you're probably asking, what the hell is a synoptical chart? <laughs> uh, the, the, as it so goes, I had the opportunity to go to the Library of Congress to see one of the Du Bois charts. And when I was there, the librarian said, well, you like weird charts. What do you think about this? And she showed me this image right here. So Arthur H. Skyfe uh, uh, worked at the end of the 19th century. He was a newspaper editor and publisher in Victoria, uh, Canada, which is right outside of Vancouver. Uh, he invented and patented the synoptical chart in, 19, in 1896 as a better way of creating a chronographic or a method of displaying time. This is a map that shows all 4.5 years of the US Civil War in one image. The columns represent each state organized from north to south, and the lines show every troop movement, every battle, uh, no matter how small, every casualty. At the sides of the chart, you see the, the total number of troops and the treasury for each side per each year. 
At the bottom, we have a variety of statistical, uh, of statistical information as well as some geographic maps. And it's a remarkable, a remarkable document that's not known in either the data visualization world or in uh, the Civil War history circles. It's fascinating. So there is one guy that did speak about him. And one of the things that he did is in his analysis, he started to take out the color in Photoshop. And one of the things that, if you're a, a student of history, basically there are two battlefronts and they ended up merging. And you can actually see the shape of these battlefronts kind of come together up at the top. Yeah. It's awesome. I love this thing. I mean, obviously, I've been obsessively collecting them. Um, so the synoptical chart was created as a teaching aid for schools and were created in three sizes, a huge roll that was extended on a custom-made wooden stand, as you can see here in the bottom, and then the student size, which is kind of a, kind of a poster size, and then sometimes even in a smaller size as well that could be included even in a newspaper. Uh, SCAFE created the company, the Comparative Synoptical Chart Company, and eventually moved to Toronto before ultimately relocating to London in 1900. On the right, we see here, this is actually a storefront in uh, Victoria, Canada. And over here, we see advertisements and uh, a map on British history in the window itself. There's actually a lot of information about SCAFE out here. Uh, but I have really had to dig to find it. <laughs> I can tell you that. So this is a really important chart for me. Uh, this is the history of the United States from, from uh, uh, created in 1896. It displays 400 years of historical information organized by the three geographic areas of exploration by nationality, the British, Spanish, and the French. The columns are, again, states. Uh, the center column plays, uh, displays political events, wars, and after the Revolutionary War, which is right here, it shows the presidents and the political parties. It's a masterwork of information design. It has so much information. It's incredible to see. The design also uses typography in a hierarchical fashion, uh, similar to what you find in cartography, to allow the audience to read the chart in different levels and different distances. Literally, this text here is not much bigger than we're looking at it now. You can go look at this chart from across the room and keep walking until your nose is almost touching it. Fascinating. What's most excited is that I rediscovered this map in the New York Public Library. <laughs> it was in, actually, as four different sections. They didn't even know it. They literally were like, what's this? Uh, when I piece them together, you can see just how big it is. It's about five by seven feet. So additionally, SCAFE created meticulously documented pamphlets to explain the historical information. This is the cover that I also found in, uh, buried deep in microfilm. Uh, all in all, I've found 12 of these uh, different maps in libraries around the world. I've seen a number of them in person, but not all of them yet. After researching these for about, but then after researching these for about two months, I had an idea. And I went to my colleague, Rachel Ramsey, a data scientist at McKinsey, and I said, hey, Rachel, I found this thing. It's a history map. I was like, let's make one. She was like, let's do it. This is the firm history map. So this map shows 96 years. Oh, no, well, I guess you can take pictures. Go for it. <laughs> I'm still sensitive. Oh, no. Uh, it shows 96 years of uh, McKinsey history on a single image. The map is organized around a central column. Uh, to the left, we have information about how McKinsey's grown over the 92 years. Uh, then we have a column of firm events, managing to partners. And then to the left, we really speak to how McKinsey is kind of engaged with the world as a whole. We have kind of global historic content, and then how our different types of business have kind of grown over the years. So we made this thing. Oh, this, is, this is probably the most important for this audience. So we made this thing, and it was called The Secret Project. And you couldn't talk about it because it was a secret project. And it was secret for like three weeks. And myself and Rachel would be like, oh my god, we get to stay up till 2.30 in the morning working on secret projects, yay! Right? And then we made it, uh, we had a senior stakeholder that was leaving the firm, and we showed it to her, and it just was an explosion. 
we were put in touch with the managing director of the firm about a few days later, and uh, we've been extremely lucky. Uh, it took us about six months to actually kind of go through and vet the content, talk to the communications team, uh, all that stuff. Uh, and in process, I got a really thrilling chance to meet even more amazing people in the senior leadership of the firm. Uh, but it's really become quite a hit. So uh, we've actually made a number of these as really massive murals. Uh, we use a, a process called dye sublimation, which is effectively you print onto a polyester, uh, onto paper and it's kind of uh, transferred to polyester. It's fascinating. Uh, it comes in like a, uh, like a box of aluminum stretcher and then, you know, like something you'd put in like a, you know, a duffel bag. Uh, so since we've made this, we put them up in uh, Denver, uh, Kobe, Japan, London, and uh, Austria, where I was last week. Um, but this one up here, we made an interactive version. So we had a rather large touch screen. We basically separate out the layers so you can actually kind of go through, see things, magnify, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's at our new offices, McKinsey's new offices at the WTC uh, 3 down in lower Manhattan. So what's been the most interesting thing about this chart? And it's really the crux of this whole lecture, hopefully, except for this thrilling conversation we had earlier, <laughs> is that in doing the research, and we were able to create an idea that was bigger than we even knew we had, right? If we gave them a standard chart, they wouldn't actually be inspired by it. But what's fascinating about the firm history map is that the most tenured colleagues, often the most senior, found how the map itself had reflected organizational decisions they made over a 10, 15, 20 year period. And at the same time, literally, because we've done the research, we've had the conversations, some of the most junior employees, literally on their first day of the job, see it and they, they think, my name's gonna be there one day. So they, it's able to, to really inspire them. Uh, by using data visualization to show people something that they didn't ever think about before, uh, we were able to give them something that was previously, we were able to put a shape to something that was previously abstract. And as a result from this, the most fascinating thing happened is that it really built trust in my whole data team. My uh, colleagues that, uh, that I never even have contact with will speak to other parts of my um, group and say, oh, you're with this team. Oh, what do you have for, what, we need this data. You know, oh, we saw that firm history map. So it's really helped to assert our role in the organization as well. And with that, I'm done with my presentation. Uh, we're going to go back to those uh, last takeaways again. What's the, what's the first one? No rules. There's no rules. If I had asked people to make that firm history map, they would say, of course not. Why would you do that? But it's been a hit. The second thing is use whatever you can to get your point across. And the last one is learn from the past to inspire new designs for today. And with that, thank you very much. Okay. Time for a well, few more questions. Wait for the mic. Oh, pass the mic. AJ, you're up first, buddy. You're a talk, Adam. What I'm impressed with in, in this examples and others is the notion of scale. Um, in many cases, we're stuck behind a screen, mm -hmm. um, and we just see sort of digital versions of it. But getting them outside in the real world, mural size or map size, really, I think, enhances the, um, the experience. So what's really interesting about that is that I've learned that you can go too big. So the catch with this one is that people had to move physically. They had to bend over. They had to stoop. There's a picture I have with somebody sitting on the floor. With this size, it becomes like an arm gesture. It's something where the head moves but it's not like the spine or the hips. So it's, it's really interesting, it's really interesting. But I also think that the scale of it helps people engage with it in a way. And it's more of a human scale. It's a human scale, exactly right, exactly right. Okay. Yes, um, hi, thank you so much for showing us this beautiful art. I, I think it's, uh, it's, it is art in itself. And um, um, now I have a question because we're talking about scale. Um, we know that VR, AR, and all this kind of three-dimensional visualization is coming more and more. Um, first, I have two questions. First, 
When was the, what, have you ever seen a three-dimensional chart and when did the chart uh, start that they make actually sense and are good? And second, um, um, is, uh, can we um, see some kind of data visualization that is uh, using, uh, used for productivity purposes in three dimensions? Yeah. So, uh, the first, the second one quick first. Um, there was a lot of studies on movement in, uh, I think starting even, I think it's like the 50s. Um, and so that's really on productivity and like how far, and uh, it, 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 they, even, uh, they even kind of um, uh, acted out in uh, the movie about, uh, about Roy A. Kroc from McDonald's, where he actually places different workstations in certain places, and that's really an, an outcropping of this. Um, 3D work for um, movement and efficiency, like planning, I, I don't, not so, not so uh, attuned to it. But you did have a question about like a, a augmented reality, virtual reality chart. And there's one that just came out by the New York Times that I think was really, really powerful, where you're able to basically use your camera around you and kind of thumb up and down where your city is. And it actually superimposes around you different particles in the air to show you different air, uh, air pollution levels, which I think is very powerful. Is it a chart? Yeah, sure. Why not? Cool. This gentleman. Here, you can use mine. Okay, um, I'm just thinking, uh, I have nothing to do with this, but I just thought of something I never thought of before. Like in, uh, say, religion or ancestry or something like that, I can see what's going to be a powerful tool. Has it ever been explored? It has been. It's been explored a lot in the mid in the mid century. There's actually a thing called the histo map of world religions that shows something like 2000 years of world history and world religion. Um, there's been a lot of these kind of chronographics and I think they use them in edu in educational terms, but again, I feel like we've gotten lazy. Everything's a timeline that goes from left to right. You're lucky if it goes around a wall. So, I mean, me and you, we're going to make them. Absolutely. I mean, in both, I'd say Hindu and Jewish and Hebrew religion, uh, religions had a phenomenally long history and had amazing data visualization or information design practitioners in the in the ancient history. So, I think we maybe got maybe more for two more, and then I think we maybe. I was wondering what um, Shafi initially uh, had in mind when he was making the synaptic uh, charts and like what he, what he thought the uses were. So there's, it's funny because as I've started to make them myself, um, what's like, it, it, really comes, it's, it really comes out of a pragmatic approach, right? Think about it. A timeline, left or right, right? Guess what, how words go? Left or right. Well, when you take time and you map it on the Y, then it becomes like a table. And each column of that becomes some other type of data with a common scale. So it's really, it's really a very practical way of showing history. I mean, it's one that I very much would like to try to, to bring back and to, and to share with others. Um, so I think that, I mean, actually I know I have his patent um, that he was really focused on using this as a better way, simply better, more pragmatic, more easy to understand. Sure. So this is pretty abstract, but um, you know, uh, visualizations help elucidate, help us see patterns that weren't apparent before. Um, as we make more and more visualizations and that becomes more popular, have any kind of natural laws or like physics of data viz emerged, like patterns you see repeating again and again? Have the physics of data viz? Wow, that's a, that's a hardcore one. I don't, I don't, anybody have an answer? Anybody? Any thoughts? I mean, I can think again like these core principles of design, um, but I don't, I don't know about physics. I don't know. I think that's about it. Um, why don't, I'll be here, happy to talk, uh, datavisualizationsociety.com, free, fun, you know, cool, maybe, uh, Nightingale, uh, uh, we do a bunch of articles, maybe we'll talk to Jerry one last time.
And uh, yeah, so by all means, just come and, uh, and talk to me. Send an email. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I, I'm, I'm supposed to be having this screen up here so that you can follow me on Twitter, of course, because we're supposed to do that, and my website. So. Thank you very much. Let's give Jason another round of applause. Thank you. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Have a good evening.